the distinct honor of representing parts of the south side of Chicago and West Pullman and the following communities, Calumet Park, Riverdale, Dalton, Oak Forest, Midlothian, Colson, Robbins, Blue Island, Harvey, Markham, Phoenix, Dixmore, East Hazel Crest, Hazel Crest, and Oakland. <laughs> uh, everybody got that? Okay. I sincerely, I sincerely hope that uh, some of you are indeed my constituents. and uh, A lot and, of them are. What? Okay. Well, great. If you've not had the opportunity to talk to me about issues, I have an open door policy. Please feel free to come in and, and talk at any time. My office is in East Hazelcrest, near the intersection of 175th and Dixie Highway, between the South Suburban Mayor's and Manager's Office and the Southland Chamber Office is where I sit on what is called 1912 174th Street. So please feel free to come by any time if you have questions, concerns, whatever the case may be. So I'm, I'm thankful to Alan for extending this invitation to me to come out to kind of talk about you know, the impeachment hearings. Um, probably in some in some respects more so than me talking, it's probably good to kind of hear what your thoughts are because again, this was an unprecedented process here in the state of Illinois. And even as a representative, you know, there was a, a very strong or very severe learning curve for me to try to understand exactly what this is all about and what this meant. So having had the opportunity to kind of witness it on TV and watch the hearings and then watch the Senate uh, deliberations. Um, you probably have your own ideas on thoughts about, uh, about the process in and of itself. But the fact is, is that Governor, well, former Governor Bogoyevich was impeached. He was removed from office and then barred from ever running for office again here in the state of Illinois. So that is a reality. That is a fact. So what I'm trying to do is look forward to where we're going. Not so much forgetting about our past because, as they say, those who forget their past are doomed to repeat it. So not trying to forget it, but trying to look forward to, to, to where we go. It's quite obvious, as you've heard and as you've listened, our president has a very aggressive agenda to try to turn this country around and move it back in the right direction. But what's incumbent upon making that a reality is how we deal with things here on the state level. I'm very happy that our new governor, Pat Quinn, has gone to Washington, D.C. to be an advocate for us here in the state of Illinois to see exactly how we benefit from the federal stimulus package. But even beyond that, you get a package, money comes to Illinois, the question is, what do you do with it once it, once it gets here? And, and, and I think that's important. And that's where some of our conversations need to be with our current elected officials, our state elected officials, is understanding from them and also voicing your own concerns about the stimulus package and, and where it's going and, and what's going to happen with it. We know it's going to be a lot of money. And a lot of the talk in Illinois is about a capital bill and roads and bridges. But even today, I had a, a conversation with Elaine Maiman, who's the president of Governor State University, who asked the question, well, how does this benefit higher education? And maybe some of you are educators in the room or have worked in higher education. So she said, well, how does this benefit us in higher education? And in, even beyond that, uh, I am the chairman of what is called the Health and Healthcare Disparities Committee in Springfield, a, a committee to provide a platform, particularly to small, nonprofit, community based organizations who are trying to address at the grassroots level the issue of disparity in our community. That is the health of the individual as well as access to health care for our, our residents out here. Uh, whether you say they're underinsured, uninsured, all of those different categories. We try to provide a platform, but not only just provide a platform, but provide solutions for uh, the issues of health care. So our president has talked about a very aggressive health care plan as well. You know, ultimately he wants to provide health care for every citizen in the United States. At some, at some level, whatever he proposes at the federal level has to roll out here to the state level. It has to roll out. So we have to be prepared to receive it. What the impeachment stuff did for us, it, it just really obviously put a spotlight on the state of Illinois. You know, whether you agree, disagree, or whatever, and there may be a number of varying views and opinions in this room about what happened, but it put a spotlight on us. And now that we have this spotlight on us, everybody's watching to see exactly what we do from here. So our steps have to be ordered. They have to be very methodical. They have to be very directed because, again, everybody is paying attention to what we do, uh, whether it's the federal stimulus package, uh, whether it's the capital bill here in Illinois. I mean, when we talk about the capital bill, which is rebuilding the infrastructure throughout the state, you know, we have to make sure that workforce development is a part of that conversation. 
because you get this money and you want to put people to work, but if they're not trained, then what happens? And, and those of you like Diane who represent community-based organizations, no one understand that when you get federal money, if you don't use it, it goes back. And, and when it goes back because you didn't use it, it's tough to get it again. It's very tough. So there's a lot of preparation that has to take place at the state level for to deal with what we hope will come as a result of, of, of what's going on. So again, whether you agree or disagree with the whole in, impeachment thing, again, I, I don't know if we necessarily want to debate that in any, in, any, in any great detail. But what it showed us is that there's a need for a number of things here in the state of Illinois. Now, I know that there are some elected officials in the room and some who are running for elected uh, office here uh, in the South Suburbs as well. Um, but one of the things that we have to address is campaign finance reform. I mean, if you think about what our president was able to do, just asking regular people in the room to contribute to him and, and what he was able to accomplish, there's no reason why the rest of us can't do the same thing. And what that does is that it puts us in a position where we have to. We have to be able to talk intelligently. We have to be able to talk succinctly about those things that we are supporting, not supporting, those things we want to do, don't want to do. You just can't stand up and say I'm an advocate, uh, an advocate for education. Well, what exactly does that mean? You can't just say I'm an advocate for health care. What exactly does that mean? And so it, it, it's putting the onus back on us to be good stewards, not only of, uh, not only of the people's trust, but also just good stewards uh, of the communities that we represent. We have to make sure that we are in a position to do that. So one of the things that comes out of this whole discussion about, uh, uh, about impeachment is campaign finance reform. I know there are gonna be several bills in Springfield that are going to limit contributions uh, that individuals can make, because currently in Illinois, this is kind of the, the, the irony, not irony, but the funny part of Illinois, is that campaign, exactly, campaign finance in Illinois is buck wild. To, to use some vernacular, it's just absolutely buck wild, which means that anybody, anything can give as much as they want to who they want. That's the way it is here in Illinois. So if there's an organization that has $100,000 and they want to give it to a candidate, they can give it to a candidate if they want to. So, so it's, it's very loose and very lax here in the state of Illinois. Um, some of you who are probably more scholarly than I am have probably read the books that exist that talk about Illinois politics and, and how we are often the subject of, of a number of books and discussions because we have such broad parameters here in the state of Illinois. So, um, so that's one very positive thing that will ultimately come out of this entire discussion. Now how that will trickle its way down to the local level, because many of you are, are local candidates, I'm not sure about that, but certainly at the state level, because our parameters are so broad, there is going to be a lot that's going to come our way in terms of ethics and in terms of campaign uh, finance reform. But on the issue of ethics, obviously what this impeachment stuff did for us is that, again, it, it's, about, it's going to make us accountable. And I think Alan mentioned that in his remarks, about accountability. It's going to make us truly, truly accountable to what we say to you as constituents. And again, if you're paying attention to the things that are said to you, if you have questions, it should make you go, oh, hold on, I don't, I don't quite understand that, or, or what was that again, and you know, exactly what does that mean uh, to me as, a, as an individual, as a, as a constituent of yours? What exactly does that mean? So it's really just putting a lot of focus back on the elected officials here um, in the state of Illinois. But again, more importantly, it's all about, a, about how we move forward from that. So tomorrow we go to Springfield, and that's our first session after all the impeachment stuff. And you know, it's the first opportunity where we get together. So we get there, we're going to vote to uh, adopt our committee rules, and off and running with the rest of our, the rest of our session. But even more importantly than just us beginning, you know, beginning that, those conversations about ethics, about campaign finance reform, you know, those are conversations that I actually need each of you to engage in. You know, let me ask a question, and, and, and this may be the wrong room to ask that question, but how many of you actually know who your state rep is? <laughs> okay, just about everybody. That's, that's good. That's good. There are some rooms that I go into, and you ask that question, and you hear crickets chirping. How many you know. people here have Will as their state rep? Well, let me ask that question. Okay. Ask, ask well. <laughs> 
Well, I, I got a few hands, so so that's good. Yeah, and, uh, and hopefully we can have dialogue moving forward. But but just knowing and understanding those kinds of things are important because again, moving forward, what you need to be able to do is to engage your elected officials, engage them, and 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 call their offices and 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 and, and try to get on their calendars if you're able to do so, or to try to have conversations with them if, if you're able to do so. Because again, now it's back upon upon us here in the state of Illinois to, to start to do the right thing, to really be able to understand exactly that which we have been given. It's often said, um, you know, be careful about that which you ask for. Because once you get it, the question is, what do you do with it at, at that point moving forward? So we've asked for this opportunity to be your representative, to represent you in Springfield, and not only in Springfield, but when we travel abroad, you know, we're still your representative. So we just have to make sure uh, that we are ultimately doing the right things. Um, you know, we're talking about service projects, um, and 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 not to uh, uh, not to deviate too much. Again, we have local elections coming up. Be engaged in your local elections. You know, these are very very important elections. These people are making decisions that really really affect your life. If you think I make decisions that affect your life, think about the decisions that a local mayor, a local trustee has to make that affect your life in terms of what they levy every year to provide the services that they need. And I know I've got trustees here in the room and they, and they understand how important that, that is. But if you, if, if you haven't engaged your local officials, take the opportunity to engage your, your local mayor or village president, your local trustee or alderman. You know, these are very, very important people. So what I, what I hope that, you know, this election process that we've gone through and, and where we are now, you know, standing here but looking forward, Again, what I, what I hope is that is, is that it's shown us is that being engaged in the electoral process is a good thing. It is a good thing because when you engage yourself, you can make you can truly truly make that difference in your community. Because at the end of the day, you you have the opportunity to elect people that you feel good about, that you think have the community's best interest at heart you know, who will listen to you. And it's not about agreeing with everything one person says or the other, but it's about, about having the opportunity to talk and to converse with them. What, one of the things that I um, often say in Springfield is that when you're talking about an issue, if you're in a room with, with both sides of the issue and somebody walks out of the room smiling, then you probably have not really accomplished anything at the end of the day. Because <laughs> that means somebody probably got their way more so than, than the other side. You know, and, and the real issue is determined when you've got both sides, you know, not feeling like they won or lost necessarily, but they got something accomplished. You know, they, 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 they went in, they talked, uh, and, and they were able to get something accomplished. That's true progress, at least in Springfield. And I can assume that even at the local level, that is indeed true progress. Even if you, even if you watch and, and listen to our president as he's um, taking his plans to, uh, to Congress, and, and, and trying to get bipartisan support. Again, he's trying to get bipartisan support because he wants everybody to benefit from it because as he's often stated, he's not the, the blue president, he's not the red president, but he's everyone's president. He is the president of the entire United States despite which side of the aisle you, you may be on necessarily. But that's what he talks about. And that type of attitude needs to be able to trickle its way down to uh, not only to myself in Springfield, but also to each of you here uh, in your respective respective communities, and that's that's truly, truly, truly important. That is so, so, so very important. And and I know Alan wanted me to talk a lot about the impeachment stuff, but that's you know, okay. Does anybody have any questions? For well, okay, question. Hi, uh, my name is Mary Beth Hill. I'm from Springfield. Um, I have a question for Mr. Hall. Um, obviously, we're going to have to I also know that Rob Blavich was mentioned by name in that bill, in that they would not release any funds to the state of Illinois while he was governor, unless they released it to the legislature. When they do release the money, how much are we expecting in Illinois, and what's the process for, I know there's certain initiatives in the bill, but what's the process for allocating the funds to those initiatives? I, I think as we start our session in Springfield, those are the questions, specific questions that we have to answer. Because again, if you talk about um, roads and bridges, that's so broad, that's so very broad. So what does that truly mean in terms of infrastructure? Now, in terms of the specific dollars, 
I don't I don't know the specific dollar amounts as, as things will be allocated and how they're going to be spent. Again, that's what we're going to start discussing at Springfield. And again, that's where you need to start engaging your state elected officials and start asking them a question. Now, if you're a housing advocate, but you may have a number of other advocates in the room. Uh, you know, I know Diane deals with sex offenders, uh, among other things, and, and there are probably another other a number of other community organizations represented in this room. So you have to start asking those questions. What does that mean for me? And as we start to dissect the big picture and start to really look at it in terms of a micro, you know, looking at it and dissecting it, you know, those are questions that hopefully your state officials will be able to answer for you as we move forward. Uh, but again, I think one of our greatest challenges is figuring out how we can try to help everyone. Because when you think about money at, at this magnitude, you think, well, there's got to be enough to do everything that we want to do. And the question is, can we do everything, or do we have to you know, try to spread it out a little bit more and do a number of, of different things? But again, as an advocate for whatever it is that you advocate for, just make sure that the people who are ultimately going to be making that decision, like myself, know how you feel. Just make sure they know how you feel, whether it's a phone call, email, fax, uh, uh, a personal meeting, whatever the case may be, just make sure they know how you feel. You know, yeah, absolutely. I mean, but I mean, when you think about, you know, some of the problems that our country has had in terms of its economy, you know, foreclosures, uh, bad credit, people can't buy things, you know, you think about that, and so you just you just perplexed, well, how do you ultimately kind of solve and fix all of those problems? And, and I don't know if we're going to be able to fix them all, all at once, you know, but we have to start making incre incremental progress. We have to start making progress toward putting the country back on the right track and giving individuals, some of which may be in this room, the opportunity to support their families. If, if, if you suffer job loss, we have to be able to, to give you the opportunity to get back to work so that you can pay the bills and, and, and contribute back into the economy. I think the, the standard is that the best way to fix the economy in some cases is simply put people back to work. Because when people are working, they spend money. When people are working, they spend money. Whether it's just basic needs or, you know, they splurge a little bit here and there. But the bottom line is when people are working, they spend money. And that's why when you talk about capital bill, roads and bridges, and I use that term in a very broad sense, you know, that's where it seems like a lot of our conversation is going because we want to try to put people back to work first, and then allow things to kind of evolve from there. Yes, ma'am? I have two questions, Will. One is, as we think about this, all we seem to talk about these days are federal dollars. So we have this sort of expectation, <coughs> as you said, that those federal dollars are going to come down and they're going to answer all of our fields and concerns. And we know that that's not going to be the case. The, the term that I keep hearing in D.C. is shovel ready. So any project that we're that they're talking about considering with the dollars that they are sending us, they're looking for the blueprints for everything to really be in place for people to start actually utilizing that money within a 90-day period of time, as opposed to a So I'm wondering, what, so one question is, what projects do we have in Illinois that are shovel ready that we can expect to get funding from? Just give me a second because I'm old and I forget it. Okay, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, see, I think I've already So when I think about the other thing I guess I'm, I'm, I'm really sort of wondering about is we're talking about workforce, we're talking about preparing people for jobs and all sorts of things. Are we going to see this become a, a state agency issue? Are we going to see this become community-based organizations that will, a, a scenario where community-based organizations will be a part of the thinking and a part of the delivery? What is the thinking around that? Well, I'll, I'll tell you what, what my thinking is. Now, to answer your first question about what projects are shovel ready, uh, I think we're going to find that out very soon. But, but using that terminology happening is that people see that and they say, and, they, and, and even if there's no one definition for what shovel ready is, people will say, well, I need to be ready to go. More, more or less, they're saying I need to be ready to go. Um, with a project, with an opportunity, if that money comes. So I think it's just really encouraging folks, you know, to do what they can on their own, obviously, but to at least try to move their projects, their, their efforts along as far as they can uh, until the big dollars are needed. So, so I don't think, I don't, I assume we're all talking about creating some type of shovel-ready project list. And again, as we start our appropriations hearings, 
uh, coming up in the next couple of weeks. We're going to hear a lot about that because even I told you about the conversation I had with um, Dr. Maiman from Governor State. You know, they want to renovate their uh, science room. You know, and she said it can't be more shovel ready than it is right now. You know, so all she needs is the money to get going. Now that's what she says, but I don't know whether the architecture, the engineering is done, you know, those things like that. But we're just trying to encourage those who think they have projects that should qualify for this type of resource to at least try to move those projects along as far as they can. I, I think that's really what it boils down to. And we know dollars are, are tight, and a lot of our community-based organizations in particular have suffered. Many have had to close their doors, reduce services. I mean, you name it, they're, they're dealing with it one, one way or another. So I think that's a segment of uh, organizations that we have to be able to, to deal with. Because again, we're talking about being able to provide the services to our community residents, but if there aren't enough organizations to do it because they've had to shut their doors, then we've got to bring back the resource to at least get them up and running again. So, so it's, it's, going to be, it's going to be challenging, and I think over the next couple of weeks, we will talk more about what projects are indeed shovel ready. Um, so, so again, this is where if you run a community organization or are part of one, again, this is the opportunity to begin to address and engage your legislators about projects that you have that you think might have reached that threshold so they're ready to go when those dollars come. And then your second question, which was... You do have to answer this. Yeah. You have to answer the CBO part of this. You have oh. to answer my question. And I'm going to cut you off because you did tell me you had another meeting to go to. Right. Well, I can you take have... one or two more questions. Oh. Uh, Has anybody know. got another question, a short question? Okay. okay. Well, it, it's been an issue. Uh, the mayor said so got together and they were talking about whether money is going to go directly to states or should money be funded directly to municipalities at the local level. Uh, sometimes it's a hook and it's a hang up getting funds to municipalities themselves. What is the, what is the thinking on that bias on the uh, state side? Well, I'll tell you what my thinking is. I think, as I've talked about some of the challenges that we're going to have all over, this is, all, this is an opportunity for transparency. Opportunity for transparency and government. Not that, not, that, not that we don't trust, if I can use that word, you know, communities to do the right thing with the resources, but unfortunately we have some track records in some of our towns that you know, have a tendency not to do the right thing. So again, I think this is an opportunity for transparency. Now, I'm not necessarily an advocate for monies going directly to your municipalities. Uh, I, I'm not an advocate for that. I think it needs to go through a couple of hands, but again, this is the opportunity for us to be able to sit down and dialogue together. And it's not a function of whether I supported you as mayor or, or didn't support you as mayor. We have to think about the residents that we all represent. And if we're all on the right page and in the right frame of mind in terms of doing the right thing, then that shouldn't matter. We're sitting down, we're having a conversation about what to do with those resources. So, so I'm an advocate for that. Like for instance, uh, one of the things that I hope to be able to talk to our president about is continuing funding for what was called the Deep Tunnel Project. Um, the Deep Tunnel Project was, uh, over the last 20 years, they've been building a series of underground tunnels to connect the Thornton Quarry to a quarry out west and a quarry up north, so that when it rains very heavy, Communities have uh, a flood mitigation opportunity, and the water is supposed to drain into those big tunnels, be shuffled to the southern part of, uh, of Lake Michigan, go to a filtration plant, and then dump back into the lake. Now, they've been doing that project for 20 or so years, 20 or so, and it's been like $20 million a year for 20 years to, to, to do this. The problem is that if you're in a municipality that has old and aging infrastructure, it doesn't matter what happens underneath because when it rains, you don't have the ability to get the water into the toes. You, you can't get it there. So I want to encourage him to continue that funding for municipalities. But I want the federal government to bring in the Army Corps of Engineers to do the assessments, figure out what those dollar figures are, and then bring that money directly to the communities. But it's based on what the federal government does. Let them be the stewards of that money. Let's, let's, let's not mess it up, let's not do anything wrong with it, but let them be the stewards of the money. So to your, to your question, I think that that's the kind of relationship that needs to be had. We have to have that transparency because we don't have money to waste. We don't have money to waste. And if we're looking forward to, you know, not only the next four years, but the next eight years and beyond, we have to be good stewards of the taxpayer's money moving forward. 
moving forward. Because if not, there's a possibility that we lose that White House and then we go back to some of the same policies and procedures that we just beat, you know, on November 4th. So transparency in government has to play a vital role in whatever resources we can. It has to, plain and simple. Yes, ma'am. Uh, what is happening with the neighborhood stabilization money? Back in October, HUD uh, issued $3 billion to be distributed all around the United States, and the state of Illinois got $128 million. Some of it was supposed to be for Cook County, out here, and what have you. The money is there, but uh, do you have any idea when they're going to release the request for proposals in order for organizations to obtain the money? You can build a home or you can renovate current properties. Out in the south suburbs, the key community was Chicago Heights if they wanted to start. There's a list of uh, communities where uh, they wanted the home stabilized in Chicago Heights as far as are you aware of that? Are you aware of the program? Well, I, I have some knowledge of it, but I don't have the intricate knowledge that you need. But that's something that I can follow up on for you to see if I can get a better answer to you. What my guess is, is that, again, when we, when we talk about big pots of money like that, and we say, okay, Illinois has this money, sometimes we're not prepared to be able to distribute the money appropriately. You know, with the RFPs and other things. So if there's an RFP that's still forthcoming, chances are they're still trying to put the, the finishing details to it so they can distribute it. Uh, my guess is that's what's happening to you, but I'd like the opportunity to, to take that back and maybe get a better answer to your question and, and, and have a different dialogue with you about it. And in my next email, I'll make sure that I, I have this contact information. We really need to wrap it up and go on to the next agenda item, but thank you very much, Will. I appreciate it.